Welcome back to my channel for a slightly more controversial yet desperately needed conversation. I could file this under the list of things we should have been taught but weren't taught and now the market takes advantage of section. I want to talk to you about the five things I could care less about being on any beauty product label. I'm not going to go so much into the scientific data. There are brilliant channels already on YouTube that do that. I really enjoy watching them, but I find your average consumer doesn't want to know the numbers and the data that the science has proven. They just want to know, bottom line, how this applies to me. So I'm going to explain this information in a way that you will be able to grasp onto it and know how to apply it immediately when you're done watching this video. So without further ado, let's get into the top five things I could care less if they were on a label. The first thing I could care less if it's on a label or not is if a product claims to be paraben free. It feels like everything from hair care to skin care to makeup is claiming to be paraben free and I honestly am struggling to figure out why. There is no scientific data to prove that parabens are bad for us. In fact, the FDA has gone on official record to say that they have no problems with parabens being in our products at all. So where did they get this bad rep? All of the research done around parabens that's shown them to be such a scary ingredient were either done in extremely high concentration doses in rats, which if you've noticed lately, rats and humans are quite a bit different, or they've been done in a test where there was no control. A control means you've tested the ingredient in a, in a base scenario so that when you're testing it in other scenarios, you know what the, your, your plumb line is. When they've tested parabens in cancer patients, they only tested them in cancer patients, which means they didn't test them in healthy human beings as well. That's like saying, if I'm gonna test somebody who has cancer and they all have water in common, then I can claim that water is what caused their cancer kind of how this study has worked with parabens. They've tested these patients, found paraben in all of the tissue, and claimed that the paraben supposedly caused it. Again, there was no control and there were no other tissues sampled. The other thing that parabens have working for them is they are effective at preserving your product at extremely low doses. Honestly, you'd have to eat buckets and buckets and buckets of a product that had parabens extremely high on their ingredients list before you started seeing any adverse effects. I saw a sponsored beauty post online the other day and they claimed to be clean and paraben free and all of these things that were talking about how horrible chemicals are in your product and I had to laugh when the picture they were featuring was of blueberries, a natural source of parabens. Long story short, We've been brainwashed into thinking parabens are bad just because we've heard it so much. And brands are now having to find alternate ways to preserve their products that are not as proven and often have to use a higher concentration of the product. But because we've demanded that their products be paraben free, that's why you're seeing it so prevalently in the industry right now. Just know that the use of parabens has had zero evidence of it affecting the human body in any negative ways. The second thing you're going to see on labels a lot is this phrase, non commonogenic It's a fancy way of saying, we're hoping that this isn't going to clog your pores. As somebody who has extremely acne prone skin myself, I used to give this a lot of weight. The thing about this scale though, is they test individual ingredients on the inside of a rabbit ear, most, most commonly. And again, the inside of a rabbit ear is not going to react the same as a human face will, or in the cases that they do test on a human, they're often testing on their back and not on their face. Again, it's gonna be a very different type of skin than what's on our face. So they test these individual ingredients in extremely high concentrations on somebody's back, and they don't, te they don't, they don't tell us whether that person is acne prone or whether that person is normal skin or dry skin, it's just tested on a blanket uh, group of people. Then they come back and they test and say, well, this is how it reacted to that part of the skin. We're gonna rate it. The lower the number means it's probably not gonna clog pores or it's less likely to clog pores and a higher number means probably shouldn't put this near your face or it, it's a no-go for those with more acne prone skin. The thing is any ingredient can set off anybody's skin. What might work great for one person and have no problems might be the worst possible thing you could put on somebody else's skin. We're all so unique in this way. Also, the scale only applies to individual ingredients and not necessarily the formula as a whole. 
For example, if I take coconut oil and I put it directly on my skin, I will break out. Coconut oil and I do not get along. I wish we did because all of those miracle cures on Pinterest sound amazing, but I can't use it on my skin straight. Does that mean that if a product uses coconut oil somewhere in the ingredients list, then I shouldn't use it? Not necessarily. If the ingredient is formulated with other ingredients, I'm not getting straight coconut oil and that, prop, that, that product may work fine for me. If, now, if coconut oil is higher up in the ingredients list, I'm gonna pay closer attention for myself, but that's because I've gone through the trial and error to figure out what my skin likes and not just landed on what this non comedogenic scale has said. Basically, I don't think this scale is a waste of time, but I don't think that it's fair to give a blanket statement for everyone when we're all so complex. If the term non comedogenic is on a label, that doesn't mean I'm nixing the product, it, but I'm gonna take it with a grain of salt. The third thing I see on labels all the time is dermatologist recommended. Now, if you're a dermatologist, don't please hate me, but I'm going to shed some light on what this means for us as the consumer, because most people don't know this stuff. Dermatology is the most affluent yet most diverse of the medical fields. In layman's terms, that means that dermatologists make more money statistically than any other doctor and yet their opinions can be more diverse from each other. You can have the same person with the same skin condition go to two different dermatologists and get two different diagnoses and prescriptions, and you can't prove either one of them wrong because the science can't disprove either one of them. It can support both theories, actually. Some dermatologists say that you shouldn't be on a retinoid until your skin is showing active signs of aging, which is typically in your late 20s to early 30s, whereas another dermatologist might say, you need to be using a retinoid earlier in your early 20s or even late teens as a preventative for aging. Neither one are wrong, it's just perspective and opinion. Now, knowing how diverse dermatologists are in all realms of the beauty industry, let's take a step back and look at that claim of dermatologists recommended on the side of that product. First of all, many times that dermatologist is gonna be hired by the brand to support the product I'm not saying a dermatologist is going to recommend something that they don't endorse, but if they're being sought after to endorse their product specifically, it's typically because the brand knows that the dermatologist is in line with that thinking. Rarely you will see a brand do third party testing, which is sending their product typically blind to a third party to have it tested and get the results back. That is extremely expensive and many brands just don't have the budget for that kind of testing, but that would be the best, most efficient testing because it's unbiased in any way. Now I think dermatologists are amazing and the research and development that they have done have trickled into so many of our products that has personally changed my skin and many other women. So I'm not knocking them in any form. I'm just saying if a brand says we have a dermatologist somewhere that says that this is a good product, that's not enough for me to buy it. I'm most likely going to go to other reviews and other people for feedback before I just take their word for it. The fourth item I want to talk about is consumer studies. And this is often phrased as studies show that 97% of women found such and such a result after using our product. The thing is, it's often a group of people who are not moderated, we don't know what they know, we don't know their skin type, their age, their demographic, what their routine is, what their knowledge base is, they're using this product and then jotting their thoughts on paper and sending it back to the brand. Or sometimes a test may set up the test to land in their favor. For example, if they're testing a moisturizer, they might say, oh, well wash your face for a week and don't use any moisturizer and then at the end of the week use our moisturizer and tell us what you think. Of course their skin is going to feel better because their skin has been stripped and it's been screaming for moisture for a full week. Of course those results are going to be positive. So when it comes to consumer tests, there's really no way to measure the results. Then there's clinical testing, which is much more expensive, so you're not going to see it as often, but it actually is helpful to us as the consumer. It's where a group of people are taken and they're monitored before the product, during the use of the product, and after to test its effectiveness. This is extensive and expensive and many companies can't afford this. So what they will opt for is clinical testing, but in a Petri dish. They're testing in the same conditions again, before, during, and after the product to test the effectiveness of it. 
but it's not on human skin. So it's in theory going to work for you, but you really won't know until it gets on your skin. My fifth item that I could care less if it's on a label or not is natural or organic. I know I'm ending on a doozy here because this is a huge part of the industry, but hear me out before you just turn me off. As scary as this may sound, there are actually next to no laws regulating what natural means in skincare. Yet there are hundreds of thousands of brands and blogs and beauty influencers who are screaming from the rooftops that if you don't use all natural products on your skin, you're gonna get all of those nasty chemicals into your face and into your bloodstream and they're gonna ruin your life. Thing is though, have you ever had poison ivy? Or have you ever been bitten by a rattlesnake? Because those are both considered natural. On the other hand, products that are synthetically created in a lab, they're tested through the roof. They have to be cleared by the FDA before they are allowed to be put into beauty products and scientists can regulate down to the particles in every single batch to make sure that every single ingredient that comes out is consistent and always safe. Before I go on, let me just debunk something really quick. Everything is a chemical. If a brand is trying to sell you a product that's natural because it doesn't contain any chemicals, please just put on your thinking cap and realize what they just told you. Many times if you go to question them further or look on their websites, uh, you'll find that they don't really know what they're talking about. They're just making a blanket statement because we've been trained that natural is always better. When we hear the word nature, we often think of green and grass and plants and it's wonderful and I love nature. But to say that if it isn't directly from nature, you shouldn't be using it on your skin is fear mongering disguised as health advice. And when brands say, oh, going natural is better for the environment, here's my argument. If that's the case, we would have harvested all of the bark off of all of the willow trees in the world by now. Instead, scientists studied willow bark to figure out what the molecule makeup of it was so that they could replicate it in a lab. By the way, this is where we get salicylic acid from. By figuring out what to replicate what nature has taught us, we are actually protecting the environment while creating a more cost efficient system. Now when it comes to packaging or recycled materials, that's a whole different topic. Here I'm talking about the formula, what's in it, what goes on your skin, and claiming that natural is always better. It, the science just doesn't support that. Organic is a step above natural, but not by much. Again, there are very few laws that regulate what organic means in a formula, and a lot of the laws that we have here in the United States are regulating our food and not our products. Instead of being satisfied by a few simple words on the front of a label, educate yourself and learn about more about what's on the back of the label in the ingredients list. Or if you don't have time or don't care to learn for yourself, find someone who does and ask them to help you. I mean, some people actually get insane amounts of joy from researching this type of thing and it gives them such satisfaction when they are able to help you and support their families in the meantime. As an extra bonus item here, anytime a brand claims that their product is non-toxic, I literally, I laugh out loud. Uh, the FDA requires that every formula be tested and approved as non-toxic before it's even allowed to hit the market. So for them to claim something is non-toxic is like saying, look, we obeyed the law, our product is legal. How about instead of wasting the ink to tell me something that everybody is already required to do, why don't you tell me more about what your product does and not just what it doesn't have? We don't have to be pitted against each other and hate people who think differently than us. It's not that there's natural and organic over here and then there's science-led skincare over here. There can be a middle ground. A lot of my products fall somewhere in here. I like that there's science to prove that ingredients are gonna be effective at meeting whatever needs I have for my skin. But that doesn't mean that I'm gonna say, oh, I don't care the environment, I don't care about the packaging, I don't care that they do or don't recycle. That would put me more over here. But instead of polarizing ourselves, let's become educated and find what's best for us, for everyone, and for the planet. Thanks for tuning into this week's video. I realize that this is a really huge issue and this isn't gonna change overnight. And I would honestly love to hear your thoughts. What have you been taught? What have you researched? What have you found? I'm always willing to learn. 
and welcome new ideas. My desire is that we stop buying into all of this marketing mumbo jumbo and start building into what is actually going to make life better for us and for the people around us. Until next week, keep finding ways to reveal and refine your beauty, be it in your products or in the way you interact with people about your products. Thanks. See you next week.